All right, everybody, we're back. It is Jack Murphy Live Show. I am Jack Murphy. Apologize for a little bit of the delay there, guys. Uh, today, I have a very special guest, an old friend, someone most of you know very well, Mr. Michael Cernovich. How are you doing today, bud? Doing well, thank you. Man, it's really great to have you on the show. It's great to talk to you. We got a lot to talk about. Uh, you know, we go back a long ways, Mike, and I've seen your journey and your process uh, from a perspective that not a lot of other people have. And so it's been fascinating to really see. And one of the ways I wanted to start this off was I wanted to ask you, how do you describe yourself to people today, right? Because I want to go back to see how we got here, but how do you describe yourself to people today in terms of sort of like what you do? Well, that's a hard question. In real life, I just tell people I'm a personal entry lawyer because if somebody gets in a car crash, I can refer the case out and I do keep my law license active. But otherwise, it's, it's been kind of a challenge since 2015 because in real life, you know me, I don't like to get in, engaged in these long conversations with people. So if you say, oh, I'm a writer, they'll say, what do you write about? Mindset, what's mindset? Man, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to make friends with new people, right? I don't know who you are. <laughs> So in, in terms of real life, I just lawyer, personal entry lawyer is real easy to move past. Nobody ever wants to know anything else about that. They think it's like a boring answer and that's fine with me. In terms of, you know, the other day I was on Timcast and they, they said, well, introduce yourself to the audience. And I go, I don't know, man, I'm just kind of an entity that, that exists at this point. It's, it's like, what do I even do? I made films, wrote books. I am, you know, a lawyer. I've done all kinds of things in my life. But when you're trying to say, what do you do now? It's not even that I'm so bold labels can't contain me. I'm not even <laughs> in, in any of that kind of bullshit. It's just there's really there's really no answer to that question. I'm just the kind of guy who exists and writes and says things. <laughs> yeah, well, which is an interesting place to be, right, and saying things professionally. Uh, and, you know, it was a long, a long road to get here. And I'm wondering, like, if you look back, did you set out with these kind of goals in mind to become an entity that just does and says and write things? Or what was what was your process? Like, why did you start expressing yourself creatively? Sure, there's two answers to this. And one of, you know, one of them would be the probably the shallow but deep answer, which is that I imagine everybody inside themselves has a desire for significance a desire to be known to some degree i have more than exceeded my fame threshold so whether i i set off because i wanted people to know who i was maybe unconsciously i still hit that threshold years ago that's why i quit doing a lot of streams and other things that i'm trying to become less notable in a way the the deeper meaning more spiritual is i always felt like i had a a, a muse, a, a spirit, a, a, the, the Greeks call them a daemon. There was always something, a, a voice within me. And if I didn't get that energy out, then I would be very upset. I would be very restless. I, I just ha I had to get something out of me. And, you know, because you and I met at, at a mixed martial arts message board, the, the OG, the other ground, and OG was where the cool people are. The UG is where all the casual MMA fans would share their awful opinions on who they think would want to fight. So when I was on the OG, just posting to a forum was enough to get out of my system. I didn't have a picture, you know, usernames. I got banned so many times that, you know, people can just wonder forever what my username was and they'll never, they'll never figure it out. So for me, I got it out of my system, just shit posting anonymously on the OG. And then from there, I started, I guess, writing under, you know, under my name. And uh, well, I, I guess I had a law blog first, too. So any, anyway, that's a very long way of saying I always felt like I had a something, something inside me, a voice that had to get out. By the way, you're getting comments on about your audio. Sounds like you're putting your mic in your mouth while talking. So there may be some audio issues still on your end. Yeah, we've been having audio issues, which was part of the delay. Sorry about that. I just turned up the volume a little bit now. Hopefully, it's a little bit better. But usually, Mike, you're going to be the one talking, so it doesn't matter too terribly much. Uh, it sounds to me like, you know, the catharsis 
you know, that rings true for me. And uh, do you write for yourself now that doesn't get published? Do you still journal? No. No, I don't do much journaling. I do a lot of internal dialoguing primarily. And, you know, I, I just work things out kind of in my mind. I, I've tried journaling. I've done journaling. And I never would go back and read the old entries anyway. So I feel like I, I do all the journaling internally in my head as I take walks, as I drive without music and other ways. So I do a lot of that inner work internally. So you're just driving around, talking to yourself, <laughs> having conversations inside your head, dialogues. I hear you on that. I do the same thing. Although a lot of times I try to actually self-correct because I found that for me, like those internal dialogues, man, those spiral out of control really quickly. And that, that sort of brings us to something. What do you mean? Like, what do you mean they spiral out of control? Well, what I find myself doing is like, or I used to, it is like having full-on lawsuits and legal arguments in my mind with my with my adversaries or whoever it was that was an antagonist in my life at that time. Yeah, that's not that, but that's how is that spiral out of control? Well, because it wasn't it wasn't useful. It wasn't helpful. It didn't it didn't solve any problems for me or make me feel better. It was a spiral. You know, I, why am I sitting there making a case to an imaginary judge, uh, you know, with my like ex wife or whoever there in the same room with me? I never felt like it actually got me anywhere. And one of the ways that I stopped doing that was through self-talk and mindset work, which is something that you really turned me on to and turned a lot of people on to. And uh, speaking of that, like, was I wonder so much of things that people write about, like self-help advice and, and pieces of information they put out, they're talking to themselves a lot of times. And how did you come to decide that mindset was like the thing that you really wanted to double down on? And while you're answering, I'm going to switch mics and see what happens. Right. Well, I've always, mindset is just a, a name that encapsulated a bunch of concepts that I studied, applied, learned elsewhere. And it was a good catch-all label that tied everything together when I was writing for, when I was writing for other people. And th so that's the difference. The difference is that the, the, the words you use when you're talking for other people are always going to be a little bit different than the words you use when you're talking for yourself or, you know, working, working on yourself. And I found that mindset is a huge word now, but if you check the Google Trends, you, it's kind of wild, actually. You can see actually on Google Trends when Gorilla Mindset was released because search interest and the word spiked. And now it's a super common term that everyone uses all the time. Like you can't run away from it, but it wasn't that widely in use when I was, when I was using it. And I think that shows either I was riding the wave. I made the wave, some combination of both came in. So for me, it was always, I wanted, you know, I, I always wanted to live a better life. I think everybody wanted to live a better life. So in that way, it's just human, but I didn't have, I wasn't blessed with a lot of gifts. I, you know, was, was very, I had asthma as a kid, was kind of the fat kid growing up, grew up pretty poor. Dad, you know, terrible factory jobs when he had a job and, and thankfully he usually did, but it wasn't very much money. I mean, I always tell people, I remember one day, if you're young, you won't get the reference, but I was reading Parade Magazine and Parade Magazine was an insert for the newspapers. Because even if you're poor, you could still afford the, the weekend newspaper. Everybody kind of read the same news. There was a little insert magazine, Parade Magazine. Um, Marie Vossavant, the, the person with the highest IQ, would have her q and It was a fun, fun little thing. And I read something about – it said the poverty level was if you make X number of dollars for a family of four. And I was in the bathroom and I saw my dad's pay stub and I go, man, I think the number was 13,000 for a family of four, whatever the case was. My dad was making $10 and 50 cents an hour at the job. And there were six of us in the house at the time. So I, I, I always knew I was poor, but I didn't really know mathematically how poor we were. So in my case, there was, there was no way out unless I kind of figured it out. I had to look for tools uh, to figure out answers. I had to apply the tools because finding a tool isn't going to do it. That 
that's just watching porn essentially. So I had to really apply this stuff. And then, you know, then I would level up a little bit, but as you level up, you hit a new ceiling and you get hit, you get smashed a new, a, a new situation. So for me, for example, one issue I struggled with for a very long time was money. And even when I made a lot of money, I was broke. And then I would not make any money and I would be kind of broke all the time. So I didn't, nobody ever taught me about like cash flow management. Two good months doesn't mean you're going to have a good year. Two great months doesn't mean that that's going to last. The same th- reason NFL players go broke. You're thinking, oh, I'm, in, I'm making millions of dollars a year. It's like, no, no, no. You're going to make $10 million over the course of three years. And that has to last you 50 years, right? So you, you, hit, you hit a ceiling in all kinds of areas of your life. So then I would try to get through that ceiling, find a new solution. And then as you go deeper and deeper into the game of life, the world of life, you're always having – bigger solutions. You're always having bigger challenges. You're put, and then if you push yourself harder, even if you have a good life, then you push yourself harder, you're going to have a new wall that you're going to hit. So the mindset game never ends, honestly. If you want to live, if you just want to coast, then sure, it, it could. But otherwise, you're always going to run into a new, a new problem to solve. No, I can't hear you again. This is our problem. Commenters, can you hear me? Uh, if, if not, not I'm going to switch back. back. This is such this a, is weird a weird thing, thing that is happening. happening. No yeah, idea. what's going on? All right, you can hear me now, Mike? Yep. Yep, that's so weird. All right, but we're going to roll with it this way, fellas. Uh, you're an autodidact, man. You just figure things out. You teach yourself. No one is going to get, you know, no one's going to stop you. No circumstances are going to stop you. And you picked up a million skills and such along the way. Uh, just some advice for guys out there who look at you, look at me, look at other people who are making money, who are living a life, having a career, uh, doing sort of similar things in social media and content creation and such. Out of all the things that you picked up along the way, what do you think was the most powerful skill that you didn't have, that you learned about, acquired, and and have applied? Well, the number one skill is probably the meta skill, the idea that there is a solution you have to look, look at it and, and solve it. So for me, I'll do, I'll post something. Uh, and then people ask me about this thing I posted. And that tells me that they're stunted, right? So if I say, like I always tell people, I, I say every man, woman, and child who's ever had a mental health condition or think they might should look into n acetylcysteine And then people be like, well, what's NAC? I don't know, dude. What am I, your tutor? H- how about you go, why would somebody mention mental health in the context of NAC and then go off on your rabbit hole and do, you know, a few hours of work. So there's, this has been, I don't know if it, I don't know if it's a generation gap because it isn't like I look at men in their forties and think, boy, these people really got it together. But there, there is a sense where people have lost the meta skill of how to learn. I always thought if I, if I did another master class and I don't know how I would do it, that's why I haven't done it. It would be a class on how to learn. Okay, so somebody mentions this. Here's how you would go through and analyze the data or analyze the research or figure things out for yourself. So the biggest thing I tell people is you, you're you going to be able to figure it out if you, if you know how to do the work and if you're willing to put in the work. But most people aren't. And it's weird because we grew up in Google, but people don't Google anymore now. I was talking to actually Cortez about that. This was really? a few years ago. I said, man... The dumbest people ask me the dumbest things. I'm like, why don't you just Google it? And as much as Google's big tech and it's bad and blah, 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 people don't. It's, it's like you would think that the younger people would have more facility using these tools, but they actually don't because everything for them is just scroll, scroll, scroll. If it isn't on Twitter, if it isn't my timeline, if it isn't my Instagram thing, then I'm not really going to read it. And that's what I learned. Another thing I learned too is people are very – attached to their platforms right so if they're if you're on twitter you don't read this is i'm different and probably you're different too if i read something interesting on twitter because i'm usually reading twitter from my laptop i go well that's interesting and then i look it up i'll go to pubmed or i'll do DuckDuckGo, google bing whatever people do and i'll say that's interesting and then i'll be an hour in this other rabbit hole but i don't think a lot of people go cross plat or I'll buy the book. I'll say, Oh, somebody mentioned a book. Or if I listen to a podcast, Oh, that's an interesting book. And then I'll download the audio book and I'll start listening to audio book 
on my hike. So people, and I learned this when I was moving around the platforms, people are very domain specific. If they're on Twitter, that's all they use. They're not going to go look for answers anywhere else. People are mad that I, I made it now so people can't reply to my tweets. And I said, well, I have a telegram and I have a commenting community on Telegram. Why well, don't want to go on Telegram? Well, then fuck you. Then how about <laughs> fuck you? Right. If, it, if it's so important that you comment, then all you have to do is install another mobile app, go to Telegram. But no, people are very and that's probably why tech companies do tend to have a monopoly. The network effects are there. The network effects are sticky. But that really holds people back in a lot of ways where they think, oh, it's insurmountable to install Telegram, right? To me, that's just the dumbest thing. What do you mean? You just, it's easy. What are you, what are you talking about? But they've been raised on these. They never leave their little silos. And then because of that, if they don't read it on Twitter, they're not going to say, oh, I uh, that's a good audio book. I heard about on Twitter. And maybe <laughs> I should go download the book and listen to it while I go take a walk. So people, they're living, because I know, because I follow a lot of people. I follow thousands of people on Twitter. And people don't post the, the stuff that I post. They don't post good music for the most part. They're not posting about camper vans, yurts, alternative living. They're, they're largely mad that they can't live in a McMansion, which I don't live in a McMansion. You don't. Um, you know, we've always lived in very small home situations. And I'm thinking, God, you're a guy in your 20s with no kids, no obligations. You could probably live off in the right area, 2200 bucks a month. And, and live nice, right? If I were in my mid twenties, I could live nice off 2,200 a month, right? 800 for a place, you share it with a friend or just go where the land is cheap or, you know, convert a, convert a van, get a yurt, get some cheap land, work whatever jobs, it doesn't matter, figure other things out on your own. So it's a very, very conventional mindset too. So that would be my, I guess if I had to tell people who really want to change it, but you're just, you think way too conventionally. There's all these cliches. The rebels buy a MacBook, right? No, the rebels don't buy a MacBook. The rebels are moving to South Dakota outside of the city, getting cheap land. And they're traveling across the country in a, in a van conversion or they're, or, or they're, they're, they have a yurt so that they don't have any fixed housing expenses. That's what unconventional people are doing. They're not sitting on Twitter all day mad that they feel like they didn't get their birthright because the boomers blew everything up. So it's, it's trying to teach people to think much more unconventionally rather than just say, okay, here's my lifeline because that's my whole life. Where, you know, where I'm living now, I never planned it. It couldn't have planned it. There's no way in the world you could have planned it. I just have always lived an unconventional life, always done things a little bit differently. And that, that led me here. You know, because if you have kids, the, the game changes a little bit. Well, but, it does. And that's something I want to bring up. I mean, dude, you touched on a million things there that would be great to dig down on. Like, where did the lack of personal agency, where did that come? How did that happen? How did we diminish that in a, in a, in a country where manifest destiny was, you know, a theme of everything that we did? But uh, specifically on this issue of unconventional living, and, and I, you know, I, I'm often talking about hey, I want to move to West Virginia, I want to get a compound, I want to build. So we've been learning carpentry skills and building things in the backyard with my son. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, man, it'd be really great if he would come with me to the compound and help me build this compound, right? But then I also think at the same time about these other guys in their early 20s who are asking me what to do and you know how do I be successful and whatnot. And my first thought is similar to what you're talking about. Live unconventionally, you know, whatever the new version of the four-hour work week is, somebody needs to write that and inspire people to think like that. But all of this sort of forgets the uh, the part about like guys want to have relationships with women, they want to have family. At some point in your life, you kind of have to go where the girls are, right? And I don't mean that crassly. I mean that in the sense of, like, if you want a family, you got to go where the women are to find a woman to start a family. So how do we square that, you know? How do we square that with, like, the notion of going to South Dakota sounds great. But once you get there and you're only one of 500,000 people and half of them are men, and, you know, it's just the, the numbers game gets really kind of tough for people who want to look for a family a conventional way. How, how, how do we square that? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't believe that because if, if they, so everything is relative to what a guy says he wants to do. So if a guy says, Mike, I really want to start a family, I would say, do you go to church every Sunday? And if you told me no, I would say, well, you're full of shit. You feel like you're horny and you want to bang chicks, which if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. But uh, so much of my mindset work is saying two things. One, you're lying to me, but that's only because two, you're lying to yourself. You don't want that. You think you want that but you really don't. So if people say, well, I want to, I want to meet the chicks. I want that. Great. But, but just say, I want to bang chicks. Don't say, I want to start a family. No, you're not. Or you, you would, and the people go, well, churches are kind of, you know, not what it was. It's like you, I would find the right church. That's like the whole point. I would probably, if I were in my twenties and I really wanted a family because me, I didn't want a family until I was in my mid to late thirties. Um, I had no early desire for that. But if I were in my 20s and I want a family, I would just take the pill and convert to Mormonism because you're going to find a very attractive wife in a very short period of time if you take your Mormonism seriously and you you do the work. So that that would be that's my but that's ultimately you have to realize that, first of all, the idea that people know what they want is a lose lose rate at younger age because you've been there. You've got what you want. and You're like, well, I got it. I, maybe I never really wanted this. You see it when you have kids too. You know, one kid wants to sit on your lap. Now the other kid's fighting with the other kid to sit on your lap. The other kid didn't want to sit on your lap though until the other one wanted to. So you're like, well, do you really want to sit on the lap or you just think that you should because this other person is sitting on the lap? A lot of things are like that. So that's why I tell people, if you want to, if you really want to start a family, are you going to church on Sunday? Okay, then you really don't. You just think that's your right answer. People say, you know, I want to be successful. How do you define success? I want to make a lot of money. Okay, great. Do you work two jobs? No, I just kind of have this one. Okay, so you really don't then. You're, you think you should. People, Because that's the issue. Is people tell you what they think they should want, and that's what they're telling themselves that they think they should want. So then so much of the mindset work is getting through that and saying, well, what do you really want or why do you think you want this? Or what do you think you're going to do if you have this? And as you tool in, you realize that, you know, for most, most men actually do not want to be rich. They can say that as a, a true statement. Most, they think they do. They think they should. But I know a lot of rich guys. You know a lot of rich guys. You don't even know they're rich. Because, you you know, you watch the YouTube yacht videos of the Petit Philippe watches and everything. most rich guys aren't doing that. Right. They're not because there's only so much you can do. And let, like if you want a yacht, that's a different thing. But if you just want most people just want some kind of inner peace, some kind of fulfillment. They want to meet a number where you don't have to stress out about money. So most people just don't want to be you don't want to be poor. Right. So th then you can steer people in that different conversation. So then when I say something like, hey, if I were in my mid-20s, I could live off $2,200. That's the opposite of all that dumb shit. You got to grind in your 20s. You got to do that. And I do believe you have to grind in your 20s. But the, the success means it's, it's counteracting that, saying, well, I mean, do you really need to do that or even know how to grind? Do you even know what grinding looks like? And do you know that most people who make their money are making it because they're doing it on leverage? They're doing it because they're playing with large amounts of capital. And when you play with large amounts of capital, the math is going to be a little bit different. And if you're just like a quote unquote regular guy, no family money, you didn't major in finance at Wharton or Berkeley, that, that whole realm is of finance is just out now. That's not even – so worrying about what people in finance are doing, completely irrelevant to anything you're going to do in life, then you, then you steer them. But that's everything about life is finding out – are you honest with yourself about what you want or do you just tell people what you think you should want and you think you should want it because that's what the culture that you're in told you that you should want. So you bring up something that I had written down right here, should versus is. Uh, and also just this notion of a crisis in a, of embodiment. Uh, it, it's fascinating to me. You, you point out something that, that I see every day. I interview guys every day for the liminal order. And every time in every session, I ask the guys, what's, what's the most important value to you? And a guy will say personal accountability and, and, and you know, per, yeah, personal accountability. And then I look at him and I'm like, OK, bro, you say that that's your, your value, but I'm looking at you and you're like 80 pounds overweight. So, like, how are you embodying 
your values, right? Like, how is it manifesting in your life? How is it demonstrating to me that this is a value that you hold dear? And you very quickly can drill down and figure out that people have aspirational views. People have things that they think they should do. They have things that, that are that are wants. And so when you were asking me or when you were describing like drilling down coaching guys and stuff and trying to drill down to what they want, this is going to be a little bit deeper question here. How much of what we want is really important versus how much of the things that we that we should be doing for like the greater good uh for society for civilization you know like how much should we really be focused on the wants is that hedonistic what is that like what do you think yeah well if you can't get what you want then how can you build a society if you can't build a life how can you build a world that's where i've noticed that a lot of people who, who cross over with politics a lot too they know everything about the world but they can't they can't build a house metaphorically right so that tells me that they're using that as a as a distraction because if they want to do things for a society if you think i'm just a compassionate person therefore i'm going to say trump should win or biden should win then i would say well i don't know how much your money do you give to charity how much volunteer work do you do a week oh no i don't but but i no, politics is sports ball for you. It's entertaining for you. It's an outlet for you. It's maybe a distraction from your own life for you. But it isn't because you want to make the world a better place. Because if you want to make the world a better place, you'd be kicking in money to charity. There's a lot of practical things you could do. You could tip extra big when you're out to eat or going around or just randomly throw 20 in a tip jar at your favorite coffee. There's a lot of things you could do if you actually cared. So that, again, is everything is about rationalization and the lies we tell ourselves. So what we do is we say, you know what, I really care about society, so I'm really going to back this political candidate because that's impact on society. No, you like that candidate. It's like a team to you. He's Tom Brady to you. You're no different than a Patriots fan. But you're able to lie to yourself and rationalize that all around politics. Where if I actually audited your life and examined your life, I would say, okay, this person doesn't give anything to charity. This person doesn't even tip particularly well. This person has never volunteered anywhere doing anything. This person does not give a fuck about the world writ large. This is all team sports and entertainment and distraction for them. So me, you know, 43, when you knew me in my old days, what did I say about politics, Right. I said, if you're a young man and you follow politics closely, you're pathetic, <laughs> right? I said that. Over, I never got into politics until 2015 because I had to earn that right. Aristotle said you shouldn't be involved in politics until you're in your 30s. What do you, some man in your 20s, know about anything? About, but those are the ones who are really the most gung-ho about it. So the idea is build your home in your mind, build your home in your body, build your home and your personal life. And then you can start to talk about wider national issues, wider geopolitical issues, but you have to earn that. When I was in my twenties, I didn't look on message boards. There were, there were message boards. I thought what kind of loser is spending all his time on the internet, right? Cause I had shit to accomplish. I had shit to do. So for me, it was all about being very driven, getting what I wanted. And then I decided that I could waste my time on the internet, although I probably wasted too much time even at that phase. So my, you know, I've done much less stuff that I used to do. But ultimately, I don't want to hear anybody tell me that they care about the world. I care about the world. Well, good. Then let, let me just run through your bank account then. I want to see th the last 10 tips you've made. I want to see the last charitable contributions you made. That Let me see that. No, no, no. I, but I, I support politics. For, no, you don't. It's just a team sport. And then you would say, well, let me see your life. You know, how many times did you go to the gym today? How many miles did you walk or run today? How many miles did you put on the bike? Show me what you – and then I go, oh, okay. So what's really going on is you don't want to lean into the pain of living. And because of that, you're into politics. And I bet if you're into politics, you're into internet porn, and you're probably watching it for hours a day then you can unravel all of this. And, and I've gotten quite good at unraveling all of that. And let me just go right to the point, as I said now, and that's that. If you're into politics, you're probably watching hours of porn every day. Write it down. 
uh, something you said really stood out to me in terms of like uh, signaling, right? The future generation, or, or sorry, the older generations signaling back to the to the young ones coming up. Uh, you know, when when I was younger, I could look up and see, oh, these people made all this money in, in the tech boom in the late 90s, and people making all this money in real estate in the early 2000s, and, you know, there was some guidance. It's like, oh, you can see someone ahead of you being successful. And you're like, oh, that's like a path that I could follow. What path is being signaled from our current generation, us, us guys in our 40s, we're ostensibly successful, independent, secure, what signals are being sent to the guys in their 20s right now? What do they have to model? What are they looking at? It's like, oh, that's a good idea. Well, it depends on their culture, which I'm so out of touch with them. I don't. I know that they're not getting our culture. I mean, if you go back deeper than to what we did, if I went really into your unconscious, I would say, I bet you that what you just told me about what influenced you was far less significant than Kung Fu movies, Bruce Lee, and 80s action films, right? If you really drill down into it, what influenced us? What was culture? What was the culture? The, the culture we grew up in was pretty cool. If you think about it, kung fu movies, getting jacked, being you know, being strong. Hulk Hogan. Yeah, cocaine, cocaine in the 80s. Even though I'm not into, even though I'm not really into cocaine, but we we had cool sort of male role models, even if they were a little bit over the top. Now they don't really have none except maybe, you know, maybe on the Internet because the culture is so different. So the cultural messaging is now telling them that if you want to be a man, the, the either one, that's the wrong thing to be, or two, they're redefining masculinity to be a woman. They're saying, well, a real man like cries. Well, I mean, maybe I cry, especially since doing ayahuasca, but you're not going to make me cry. If you want to like talk shit and you think that I'm going to start like weeping or something, you're going to be unpleasantly surprised. So being moved by a great work of art, being moved by gratitude for where you are, being moved by thinking about the struggles our ancestors went through to get us here. If that sublime energy hits you in the heart like a beam and you cry, sure. But that's not what they're talking about. They're just talking about you being a crybaby bitch and crying you know, every night because life is hard or you had a rough day and sitting around like you're in group therapy every day with your girl. And then you're finding out your girl doesn't want anything to do with that. That That's the difference is they're not saying be a very spiritually. Don't be afraid to cry because there's beauty in the world. Don't be afraid to cry if you hear a piece of music and you've developed a sense of the artistic spirit that it takes to create that. And you just feel I can't hold it in anymore. And you get a couple tears going. Great. That's not the message, though. The message isn't being deep, being magnificent, seeking awe and beauty. The message is, oh, yeah, life is tough. You need to cry more. No. So they're not getting they're not getting that or they're getting the the stuff, the, the fake success porn. Right. So they're either so they're not really getting any positive masculinity influence. And then the flip side, they're becoming, honestly, they're becoming indistinguishable from teenage girls. I say this all the time. People are like, Mike, you look old. You look tired. It's like, okay, why do you care? You're a, a man in your 20s. But they read Instagram all day. And they go like the fitness pages and everything else. And I'm, I'm just thinking, like, why do you care? What, what? But that's how they become. That's, that's what the culture has told them is to nitpick, pay, you know, pay attention to these things. And it's ruining women, too, because they're, they want nose jobs at 18. They want all this plastic surgery stuff that I didn't even know existed. So right now, the, the cultural imprint trickling down to, to all people, um, especially men. Well, actually, I think women are, you know, this is pro-man in a way. But the, the messaging for the women is probably worse because women are being taught to hate themselves. And then as men are taught to be more feminine, they're hating themselves because by hate, I mean, they constantly look at images that are fake. They're all Photoshopped. They're all filtered. And then they're comparing themselves to that and trying to hold themselves up to that unattainable standard. Because I've met so many of these people who are so-called beauties 
and they're really not. I'm like, oh my god, it was it was because I lived in Malibu for law school, been all in LA, and you're thinking, you know, these people are. There, you could find random girls on a night out who are more attractive than a lot of these people cast on. So then that filters over to men where then they hate themselves and then they lash out at you. And then all their criticisms are very feminine. Their criticisms are like, you look old. Okay. Should I color my hair? You want me to wear Botox for you? You know, I'll go get a, a laser, a laser dermis thing. What are you doing? So for me, that's been the, the, a cultural thing that I've noticed is that when, when I was, cause I've been on the internet forever, a man used to be, he would call you a loser. He would say, you're not doing enough. Now they call you old or ugly. And every criticism doesn't go to your character or to your accomplishments. It all goes to your vanity. So I've interpreted that culturally, that's some messaging that they're all getting uh, young, young men, especially. You know, we both started out writing a lot about these issues, masculinity, guy stuff, how to have better relationships, how to how to just be a better man in general. And and that's ultimately what the, the whole manosphere came to be, which is basically like raise your status, right? Become a better man, live a better life, and things will, will become better in that way. Uh, do you feel like those issues that we addressed years ago like that, do you feel like they're more important, less important, you know, more critical? Do you ever think about writing or talking more about those things? Like, is there, how, how do you, how do you even look back on that time too? Like, what, how do you see that? How do you reflect on that? Well, the message of, the message is more important than ever, more needed than ever. There's. The problem is the gap is wider than ever. It used to be, the, the way it used to work is if you were a man and you were a little younger and an older guy said, hey, here's what you should do, you would say, whoa, that was good. And then you just jump right over the bridge. Totally, wow, makes sense. Why didn't anybody ever tell me this before? Holy <laughs> shit. You get this download and then you would impact it. Now you got to deal whole generation. That's why I don't talk about these issues a lot is that won't work, that's too hard. So the bridge is so far now. So they need the information more, but the bridge is so far that they're not actually going to cross the bridge. They're going to tell you why it doesn't work. They want to treat it like a debate society. I've had that in my DMs because I always try to help people if they if they DM me. And then I quit doing that because I'm like, they just it's an arguing society. Hey, I'm not, it's not a debate society. If you tell me, hey, Mike, what should I do? And I say, go buy that book and read it. And you ask me, well, what's the book about? We're, we're, we're done now. We, we don't have a relationship anymore. This, this, is, oh, this is over for us. Whereas before, especially if, if I had been younger and had access to guys like us, I'd be like, okay, thanks, dude. And then maybe a month later, oh, I read this book. I tried this thing. What do you feel about that issue? That's how you can tell. That's actually when I do consulting and my stuff has been closed forever. The way that I can tell if you're putting in the work or not is if you're putting in the work, your question is very specific. Your question is, hey, I did this and then this result happened. Okay, then we can troubleshoot it. If you're not putting in the work, it's very vague. How do I be successful? How do I become a better public speaker? I don't know. Do you go to Toastmasters? No. Do you practice speaking in front of a mirror? No. Okay, you're, you're, you no longer exist to me where you know everything is about and that's as i become older boundaries become so important it's like okay we're just you don't exist to me because you're wasting my time you have access to someone who has by any objective metric achieved a lot and is it is, is accessible in a way that almost no one is and you're going to waste my time because you don't respect your own time that's fine you cannot respect your own time but you and i because I, I, the other day, somebody said, do you really block people on Twitter when they ask stupid questions? Yes. I said, of course. Of course. If you're asking me, how can I be a better public speaker? You are blocked because you're not going to Toastmasters. You're not doing anything. You're just you're wasting your time, and now you're trying to waste my Of course I do. That's as you get older. When you have kids, you have to be more respectful of boundaries because if you're spending time doing A, that's time, unfortunately, is zero sum. If you're spending time on A, then that's time that you're not spending on B, and then you have to do a integrity check and decide if that's how you want to do it. I think that there is no surprise why successful people 
end up writing and talking and thinking and working on time management, personal uh, energy management, uh, boundaries, uh, stress relief, uh, mindfulness, organization. Have you seen an influ uh, an in in an uptick in the importance of those things in your life as you've gotten older? Why is it common to everybody who gets to that point? I have my ideas. Interested to hear yours. Well, boundaries. I don't think most people ever learn healthy boundaries because they're you know the, I've always been very quick to kind of cut people out of my life, and people would find that kind of cruel. But I never knew what, just like I never knew what the word mindset was. I never knew what the word boundary was until maybe five years ago. I just knew that if if you were acting a fool, I didn't want to be around that energy. I just knew it wasn't being healthy in my energy. And then you realize, yeah, a lot of it is about drawing boundaries that are healthy and then finding if people respect your boundaries or not respect your boundaries. And you realize most people are just – honestly – it's just goo energy, spaz energy, which call it. Where, buddy, you don't have anything going on. You're just a wreck, a nervous wreck. And you're not trying to change that. You're not trying to modulate that. You're not doing the cold. So, for example, if you read Cernovich and you're not taking cold showers, then, like, you don't read me. I, I don't have anything for you. I don't want to talk to you. Everybody knows that I have been doing ice baths for, for however long. In contrast showers – for like however long. And everybody knows it doesn't matter how much you do cold showers, it always sucks, which is the point of it. Everybody knows that if you do the cold plunge, it sucks always. But that's why you do it because you're conditioning your body to know to know that one, it's gonna be unpleasant, but two, like you're not gonna die, right? That was a, a mantra that I developed very early on where does it suck? Yeah, are you gonna die? No, okay, then do it. There's zero risk that you're going to die. Do it unless you, you know, check your doctor about your heart, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. So they're not doing they're not doing that conditioning. And you have to keep doing that, doing that condition throughout your life. And then you have to find that's the irony of all of it is that the better you get, the harder you have to work because you're so. Maybe numb isn't the word, but you're so acclimated to things that others find hard that now you have to find something harder to do, right? So it never ends and it becomes harder in a way, but it becomes more fulfilling in a way too, because you can see how far, how far you've journeyed. The next peak, this is something I'm working on right now with my, I have an executive coach every Monday morning, 9 a.m. And we talk and we plan, we strategize, and, and he's really helped me figure out like where my priorities need to be and how to manage my time and how, how to basically increase my leverage, right? Because I'm already at 150% bandwidth, period. There are, sorry guys, there's 25 guys out there right now who I feel bad that I haven't responded to, that I know I need to, and then there's 10,000 more people just like that. I'm completely maxed out time-wise, so it's really about finding leverage. And in some now also for me, it's about looking forward to the next peak. Uh, you know, Mike, you've you've experienced this. I'm sure you, you go through a period of growth, high energy, huge output, and then the world sort of adjusts to that. And then you need to sort of recalibrate, reconsolidate. Um, have you had experiences like that? How do you reconsolidate? How do you how do you reorient yourself to to like and, and how long are these periods, right, ha, to, to look towards the next peak? Because you're never going to get to the very, very top. There's always another one over there. So how do you mentally, emotionally, spiritually reorient yourself to the world that has now changed around you because you yourself have changed? In a way, I think less in terms of peaks and more in terms of life, right? I've lived probably three or four lives in this mm. life. I've you know, here I did this thing, here I did that thing, and I was a completely different person. If this what I'm going towards now is a completely different chapter in my life. So rather than think of it, because I think chasing peaks is like chasing the dragon. So if I were your executive coach, I would be analyzing the language that you use, and I would want to get to the 
to why you use peak. Where did that concept come from? Metaphorically, why is that embodied in your brain? Maybe that's working for you. Maybe it's not working for you. But you always want to consider when you use language, the language is a representation of a metaphorical embed or an archetype in your mind. And then you ask yourself, okay, this is peak is a concept that's in my mind and it's influencing me on an unconscious level and, a, and also on a conscious level. You know, where does that come from? Metaphorically, the one I live by more is I've always said that I wanted to be, maybe not always, but I, I've put this together a long time ago, an interesting character and in, say a Tom Wolf novel. And I've <laughs> so far exceeded that. Yes. But the idea is, I want to live an interesting life. I want to experience what other people don't experience. I've stories. If I told people, they wouldn't even believe them. They, they would say that, that no way in the world that happened. So I don't even tell my stories. I actually downplay what I do and try to make it look like I'm boring and everything. So for me, the metaphor is we're all living a story, a book, a movie, a poem, a haku, figure out your metaphor. And I just want to live a new story. And how do I live a new story? I write the new story. I write a new story for myself. So in this phase of my life, I'm, I'm just much, and it's weird because it's paradox. I probably, I have more to say, but I'm saying less, right? I'm tweeting less. I'm doing very few podcasts of, of my own. I don't usually attend other people's stuff. Like Tim cast. I, I was invited months and months ago. And okay, I guess I'll go do it even though I feel like I have more to say, I just feel less drawn to that. And I feel more drawn to inwardness, the, the spirit world, the, the realm of myself, the, the realms that we don't fully understand. And that's sort of going to be my next, you know, few years of my life. That's going to be the focus for at least the next three, a chapter of your life is usually three to five years, right? Because if you date a girl and you love her, if you don't get married, that's going to wind itself out in what, 18 months to three years, maybe five if you're a bad person and you take, you know, her five years of her life, but you don't ever, you know, date her for a long time. You know, the idea is that, that but that's a chapter and you're with the whole person living a whole life. You've gone on these trips together. You've experienced these things together. With a career, people don't have 50 year careers anymore. And you're like, okay, I had a job. I started off doing X about three to five years. And then in terms of your own self-authorship, I went through the whole big jack thing. That's why when people go, oh, you look old or you got fat or whatever, it, it just it has no emotional resonance in me. It's like I've, I've been the big guy. It was fun. I liked it. It's not overrated. Every guy, <laughs> I, I stood by my writing that every guy should get big once in his life because anything you think about what the muscle thing is like, you have no idea unless you've been it. Everything people say on the internet, oh, women don't like that. They find it gross. Sure, go out in public and have women come up to you and squeeze your arm. And then you can tell me about whatever bullshit you think about that. But then I was just kind of over it. I was like, okay, like I'm a big guy. Then politics. Okay, I've, I influenced the presidential election in 2016 to a large enough degree that I'm still hated by the deep state, the media, the, you know, you name it. So that's not my ego that I influenced it. That's what they believe. Okay. I did that. You know, I've done that. I moved history. Um, <laughs> I've been a big guy. I've moved history. I enjoyed, I, I tell people I, I had a four year cheat meal and I enjoyed every day of it. I enjoyed the wine and the good food. Cause I wasn't eat, getting fat, eating Doritos. That's for sure. Mm -mm. I enjoyed every bit of it. Now I'm over that. Now I'm doing a lot of endurance work, zone two cardio, you know, just pedaling the bike until your heart rate gets to, you know, 60 to 70% long time, you know, contemplated podcasts, spiritual journeys. You know, that's where, I, that's where I am now. And then I'll probably become a novelist eventually because that's where, you know, I'm being drawn. So in 50, maybe I'll have been a, a person who wrote a couple of great novels and then I'll be 50 and think, well, what's, you know, what's next? So, Rather than, because we do have peaks and plateaus, obviously, if you're in the same realm, you're going to have, you know, good years, bad years. For me, though, it's really just about, I'm, I'm a story in a book, but I'm also the author of the story in the book, and I'm writing that story. 
I feel the same draw towards fiction. Uh, I'm, I actually got approached by uh, a major publishing house a few weeks ago to write another nonfiction book. And uh, we're doing the proposal and stuff right now, and it's going to be a great book. But inside of me, I want to write a fiction, a novel. I want to write the, the, the voice of our generation or whatever, you know, the, the less than zero or the on the road or whatever it is. And, man, you and I both know enough enough characters to actually write the Tom Wolf book of this time period that didn't get written, right? So go for it, dude. I, I strongly support that, and I can't wait to see it when it comes out. Uh, interesting, the, this idea of the varying uh, stories narrative narrative comes up quite a bit mind mindset uh self-talk um to what extent is there a connection between the information war and and the personal narrative that you tell yourself is there a connection there and what, what do well, we do well there always is i mean there's a great book wired for story that talks about the neurobiology of storytelling i did storytelling training with jerry spence and his work you know 20 years ago and you realize everything is a story. So one reason I came in and in 2015 and was able to be so effective is because I just understood that everything is a story. Everything is, can you tell a compelling story? I've, I've held storytelling seminars before myself. And then you realize when you do deep mindset work, like you're living, you're living by a story, but usually others wrote it. If you feel insecure, why do you feel insecure? Well, because other people said things to you that created a story and that story is really our code people talk about computer code software culture as an operating system as Terex mckenna call it and i'm more of the line that while culture is is ultimately your your pr programmed mind your software and your mind is all story based so you tell different stories you write different stories you write a better story for yourself internally and then you write a better story for yourself externally. And then you can tell broader, grander stories in books and films and political realms. You can tell a story about anything, but it all comes down to the basics of storytelling, emotionally moving storytelling, knowing how to tap into yourself, to your own, to find your own range. I always tell people, if you want to do better mindset work, read a book on acting or take an acting class. Well, why? Learn how to open up different emotions. Know how to feel angry. Because if you can make yourself feel angry, you can make yourself feel calm. And then you can draw from this as you're telling stories. You can draw from this as you're in different situations in life. Everything you do is fundamentally based on the stories that you tell yourself. You actually hear that. Everybody, if you ever go to like a, anything from Jordan Belfort to you know any, anything, that's one of the, they all talk about limiting beliefs, limiting belief, limiting beliefs. But a limiting belief is fundamentally a story that you're telling yourself. So then you decide to write another story for your own mind. That means go deep. A lot of people have trauma. So you, you, you're writing a story about the trauma. Usually that story is the trauma is holding you back. I can't love because I've been abandoned. Well, that's because that's the story you're living. You're living the story that because you've been abandoned, You'll never be able to love, but you're saying that you feel unworthy of love. You're not even in the real story. You feel unworthy of love because you were abandoned, and now you're telling yourself you can never feel love or receive love again. And then we, you know, we would rewrite that story, or you would rewrite that story in your mind. And then as you live a story, you're influencing culture. I've influenced culture significantly. The Everybody now does call out culture if you're conservative now. Nobody did that before me. You can remember when I started doing it, I got attacked by conservatives. Why are you doing this? That's not fair. That's what the left does. We don't do it. We don't do what the left does. Now everybody does. I don't even do it anymore. I don't need to because now they all do it. I try to tell a story about kind. I talk about love a lot. I talk about, you know, plant medicine a lot. How many people in politics, which is, by the way, another story that people tell themselves. I can't talk about ayahuasca because I do politics. And because I do politics, that could alienate political ally. Fuck that story, right? That's what so much of life, fuck that story. That's just a story that you convince yourself. So I can, I can talk about politics. I can be retweeted by the president of the United States. And then the next tweet talk about going under, under ayahuasca and experiencing a death or 
what it felt like to feel like you lose everything and find out what's most significant. Like I can do that. Why? Because I'm going to tell that story. You don't like that story. Then I'll tell it more. That's again, where you influence, you don't like the story. I don't care. I'm going to keep telling that story. I'm going to tell whatever stories I can. And then you overwhelm, then you overwhelm, right? Cause that's how you overwhelm the culture is you keep telling your stories. And then you, but of course it all fundamentally starts with the stories that you're telling yourself about yourself. I I couldn't agree with you more on that. And I do believe today that if you don't actively occupy your own mind space, it will be invaded and occupied with the story that came from somewhere else that likely does not have your best interests in mind. If you just receive the conventional wisdom and the stories that our institutions want us to follow, you end up fat, sick, chained to a desk, corporate job, in debt, and now at home in Canada with your babies in the bathroom locked up in quarantine or whatever. It's like a matter of life or death that I don't know if it was as much in the past because I wasn't there. Uh, I don't know. But the story space is the battle space today. Uh, for these ideologies and such that I really don't want to get into, and so we're not. But this well, we're thing- lucky, though. But that's the difference, too, though, is our own myop- my, our own myopia is not realizing that the ability to talk like we're talking about and use the concepts we're talking about is because we weren't early agricultural revolutionaries where we're tilling in a soil all day. And none of that mindset shit is going to help you there. <laughs> right? You just you have to toil or you're going to starve. <laughs> There's a winter time like you're going to die so that the level of discourse we're able to have with each other, with ourself is a privilege. It's a, and it's because of our ancestors and because of what they've sacrificed to get us here. But the idea that we're not being, I mean, this is why I don't have a lot of sympathy for people who complain about the culture because I think when was the culture good for men? When were men not being drafted off into some warlord's army Maybe, you know, your wife and children enslaved if you lose the war. People forget all this. I mean, hell, the Holocaust and World War II and the gulags and the Bolsheviks and the Holodomor, this wasn't even 100 years ago, right? So when people tell me, oh, the culture, the culture is this, the culture is that. Yeah, but when was it not? Probably post-World War II if you were white, right? People say, oh, I miss the good old days. Well, you wouldn't have missed the good old days if you were in the Jim Crow South. And you weren't white, let's just be honest. So you, when, when was this golden magical age where all you had to do was show up and you were going to live a great life? Well, I mean, I think one of the good lessons of Mad Men of all shows is, the, was Don Draper happy? No, he had it all, right? Isn't, isn't that the lesson of it? Yeah. Any of these, his wife's miserable because she's caught in a role. Everybody's caught in these societal roles. So probably it's been the first time in 20, 20 years where you can just go online and download information. You can just say, you know what? I'm a fat slob who hates life and hates myself. How do I not become? Oh, it's just right there. It isn't like you have to find some elder and hope the elder is not a pedo or something who molested you when you were a kid and you're confined to that. It re- it's choose your own adventure. And then you want to cry. Oh, the culture is so bad. Things are so terrible. We, we don't get, okay, motherfucker, that's fine. But you can go find anything that you want to find. You can choose your own adventure in a way that was never possible. So that's something that I don't take for granted to this day. I think, you know, think one day I was reading an article about World War I, the draft, and how these guys came back and their faces were blown off because they were in trench warfare. You'd have to run across a trench. And the movie 1918 was pretty good on that. Your face would get blown off. Imagine you're in the U.S. and you're fighting some war because the Europeans haven't been able to get along since day one because they're always in some kind of beef. And now you're an American and you're over there fighting war and you're getting your face blown off. But you want, but the culture was better, was it? <laughs> right? Re- really, was it was it that much better? And imagine how bad the PTSD must have been back then because obviously PTSD isn't because guys are soft. It's because of the trauma. So now there's never been a better time to be alive. It's not even a close call. What I love, and I'm sure you appreciate this too, is when a Twitter follower I've never heard from, never seen a reply, never gotten a DM, 
but then they just drop something out of the blue and they're like, man, I've been following your work for years. You inspired me to make change. I've lost 60 pounds. Thank you so much for everything. I'm like, that's the kind of guy that I want to hang out with. That's the kind of guy that I have respect for because you're absolutely right. It's every, all the information is out there. Information basically has no value anymore. It's basically zero value because it's ubiquitous and it's everywhere and you can get anything that you want. So the value comes in curation, first of all, from an information perspective, but then action. It's about taking action. And Mike, I'm wondering, I did notice that you cut off the comments on your Twitter feed, which at the rate that you block people was going to end up, there was going to be, you know, a singularity on that, on that at some point or another. But like, do you feel like you may miss out on some intel that way? People are, I, I, I made a conscious choice um, that it was going to be harder to find me. So if you're, if you really have something valuable, you can figure out how to make it to a cigar night, right? Get real. It's not, I, I look at it as the, if you want to learn from the Shaolin temple, you have to go to the Shaolin temple the, and train with the Shaolin monks. You have to find them. So I'm at that phase in my life where, you know, you have to, you have to find me. And if a barrier of not being able to at reply me is too insurmountable, then there's nothing missed. There's nothing of value lost. Indeed. It's not a bad approach. And bro, I gotta, I gotta tell you, so many times I'll retweet you or say we're having this call or whatever, and people be like, oh, that's Sorno, he blocked me, blah, 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 blah. And you know what the first thing I do when I read something like that? Block, block that guy too. <laughs> like, dude, dude, if Mike, my good friend, decided that you needed to be blocked, man, I take, I take his, uh, I trust him on that one, man. I'm up to like six thousand or something blocked. I mean, I do have taken inspiration from you. You, you said once, if I don't like your joke, if I don't like your vibe, you're out. Right. And this is another element of the boundaries thing that you were talking about. Uh, is is having the self respect to establish the terms on which people can engage with you. And when people encounter that in the world, they're astonished. Right. They're astonished. No one has ever put them in a situation where they, like, presented a boundary for them. Yes. Where, where so we've, we've established a number of things, right? We've established that, like, A, information is out there. You can figure out how to improve your life in the easiest way possible today. We've established that this is no running across trench warfare and getting your face shot off. We've established that men now have opportunity to seek therapy and treatment and, and, and grow and guide themselves. And it basically has never been easier to be successful in this world today. But yet somehow there's a major disconnect between all this abundance and the perceptions uh, of the people out there in terms of being able to make things happen. Do you see that gap widening? Is there something that could bring it closer together? Or are we cleaving into a society where there's people who, who act and people who don't, and that's just going to be it? No, I, I'm trying to find right now, um, it was the early, yeah, the early Earl, uh, Earl Nightingale short story called The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale. And so this was released, I think, in the 1950s, maybe before that. And it begins with, if you take, and he has a very grizzly voice. I'm kind of jealous of his voice. It's that grizzly old school radio voice where he smoked enough cigarettes to growl, but not so many that you can't hear him. And he says, if you take 100 men when they're born and have unlimited potential, within 50 years, 80 of them will be broke, 10 will be dead, 9 will be kind of okay, and 1 will be a success. So it's always been the state of the world that only a few people, uh, you know, Rich Piana called it the 5%, the five, five percenters, which came, I think, from Earl Nightingale as well, which is the people who just kind of do what it takes. What, what is it going to take to to make this happen? That's always been a, a smaller percentage of people, which is, again, why I draw these boundaries. Because if you're not in that 5%, hey, man, I wish you well, but you got to go do that somewhere else. You don't have to do it here. You can go do that. You can go do that somewhere else. Not here. That That's again, boundaries and people they are like, Oh, I got blocked. And they'll come to my telegram channel to complain that I got blocked. And I think 
you don't really have any kind of social awareness at all, do you? I would not want you at anything that I ever did. You would be the, the creepy guy. Like if you got blocked and you're in Telegram, you should be glad that you're not blocked there too, right? And then maybe figure out why you got blocked. Maybe you're the problem, right? Isn't that where all this starts? That maybe you're maybe you're not as funny as you think you are. Maybe you think you're a pro comedian. You're just, I'm, I just told a joke. Mike can't take a joke. Maybe your joke just wasn't funny. Maybe it was dumb. Maybe it's the same thing that I've heard a hundred times a day and it's some corny boomer joke. And that was your contribution to, to me reading you. Because the flip side is if I blocked you, I took a moment to, to hear you. And I feel good about that. That's why I don't feel guilty for blocking people. Is I read my replies. I took a moment to hear you. And that was your message to me. Whose fault is it then that you're blocked? You had your chance, buddy. You had your swing. You got your pitch. And it's up to you what you're going to do with it. Uh, interesting. Interesting to see how that experiment will play out for you on Twitter. I guess engagement becomes less of a factor when you're actually trying to uh, prohibit <laughs> prohibit engagement of some degree there. Interesting to see how that's going to play out. I, I can imagine the peace and quiet must be nice. Um, let's transition a little bit. You're a family man now, Mike. When I met you was before Shauna. Uh, when you met me, I certainly was like on the tail end of my, my divorce. This is like 10, 12 years ago. And, uh, you know, we've both gone through a number of changes. And, and one of the things, obviously, big deal, big change, kids. But I, I remember very specifically something that we both read on the OG back in the day. Was that uh, don't be afraid if you don't bond with your kids right away. If as a father that kid comes out and you look at it, if you don't be alarmed if you're not met with overwhelming joy or a deep, you know, immutable connection. Um, how did that play out for you? Did did you have a similar experience where it, it grows over time, uh, your connection as a father with your children? Uh, how did you find that to be personally relevant? Oh, when you, yeah, so there's all this issue that, you know, when the first time I held my kid, I felt my life purpose all molded into one. And I was, I had my life purpose sort of sorted out by then. So I remember the first time I held Syrah and she recognized my voice because I talked to her a lot when she was in the womb and it felt great, but I didn't have this cascade of emotion where I'm weeping. Now I really know what life is all about. In a way, I had um, a strange feeling where Shauna took a picture of it because people don't realize just how how surreal it is for everyone, even though so many people have had children. For you, it's your first time. You go in, you have the kid. We, we did a midwifery. You put your kid in the car seat and you go home and now you have a kid. <laughs> what? So there's a picture of me where I have an oh shit look on my face. And the, I look over, oh, because my life was good then. My life was dialed in on every kind of level. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what did I just do to my life? Was this a good choice or not? I'm in now, though, whatever it is I'm in for. And that was my feeling like, OK, whew, did I just blow up my life? What did I just do? But of course, as they get older, especially after nine months, it blows your mind how it's possible to love someone as much. It blows your mind how interesting little unique creatures we all start off as before whatever happens to our minds, you know, ruins us for a while. It becomes incredible where now I don't like you, you people when you want to travel. I don't know. Can I take my kids? I don't even want to be, I don't even want to be away from my kids anymore. But, but that definitely, it opens up. So I was, I, I felt a sense of like, this is really cool when I held her and she recognized my voice. And then I went through the, Oh man, did I just blow up my entire life? And then as they get older, because a mom's bond is always going to be stronger. They're breastfeeding. The child was just in their womb. And with the dad, there's really not that much. I always tell people, what's my advice for a new father? Be there for the mom. There's really not that much you can do for the kid. There really isn't. But you're, unless you're feeding formula or something like that, there's not that much you can do. You have to try to, to make the mom's life a little bit easier because she's got to get up twice at night, sometimes three times at night. She might not get more than four hours of sleep for a year. So she's going to like be maybe lash out at you a little bit. 
doesn't mean you don't draw boundaries, but it does mean you have to have a, an emotional awareness of where that's coming from. How would you react, Mr. Man, if you hadn't slept for more than four hours in a year? Probably you would be lashing out a little <laughs> bit too, and then you don't feed into that. Then you don't take it personally. You can't believe that. Now you're fighting. That's what happens to people is you, you feed into that energy, which is your choice. And then you make it worse, and now they have this spiral when really you're, you're just dealing with a sleep-deprived person who has been getting up three times every night for, for however long. So the biggest thing, yeah, is you can do is be there. And then as you get older, you, you know, like I would take Cyrus for hikes and carry her and everything else. It got great. Mike, help your wife? That doesn't sound like alpha male. Beta, it's beta, right? Super yeah, beta. beta. <laughs> People, people fail to understand what leadership is really all about. It's about setting a mission, getting your team on board with the mission, and then figuring out a way to be the most use and help to the teammates on the mission in achieving the mission. What is your highest and best use at this time period? When it's 3 o'clock in the morning and you've got a two-week-old and she's crying and the mom's there, what, what is the best thing that you can do? Is it to be all a fucking alpha <laughs> cold emotionless not gonna stoop to help no you do whatever it takes to help your teammate especially yeah, one who's up on from, the dl what yeah but, but that kind of feedback is always coming from the, the guys who are on instagram all day critiquing your outfits or whatever that's <laughs> not real that's not real male energy at all that that's like a yeah. child i get that all the time too it's like you're a child trying to tell me something about life but, you know, I don't I don't really care. I'm not remotely interested. But, yeah, they would be like, oh, because you see it all the time. Like, oh, you have people be like one eye is this, one eye is that. And these are people, by the way, they're not, which is, again, why it's helpful to have lived phases of life. Just like I know that if me and these guys who talk all this shit wanted to go out, I know how the night would end with them versus me. So, so much of that is tuning out the children, they're, they're children. And we were probably children when we were men in our 20s too. We were probably children. We all, we mature a lot later in life. So for me, oh, you help your wife or you do the dishes or something. I, I just kind of like roll my eyes like, okay, dude, I don't know who you are. I don't care what you have to say. You can go have fun on, on some internet pornography channel. I'm just not, not don't <laughs> care, don't care. There's definitely a dad circuitry that kicks in. I think it's probably parental circuitry where when you, before the kids, you're like, man, I, I just, how could I, my, it's not going to fit in my life. It's not going to fit with my goals, my wants, my wishes, my desires and whatever. And then the babies come and then they get a little bit older and then just all of your priorities change, your perspective on things change. Can you, can you just reassure some of the trepidatious guys out there that like the whole thing changes? So, like, it's impossible to project your your mindset from your 20s into you being a, a dad and, like, having it relate. Well, in a way, I can't because if they have the trepidation or fear, then uh, that's how I lived my entire life with trepidation and fear and confronting my fears and, and jumping in. That That's part of the, the mindset work is, yeah, your life's going to change. Flip side, though, is, you don't know what your life, because that's the idea. Is people think that they know what their life would be life, like if A didn't happen. <laughs> well, I know, you know, oh, I have kids. That my life is going to change. Well, I don't know. Maybe you would have gotten a car crash because you'd have done something reckless. Because you're a 40-year-old guy, you would live a very reckless life. Maybe you would get caught up in some kind of bad situation. Your life could be fundamentally worse. But everybody has an idealized version of, you know, this is what would have happened. This is what's going to happen. When really you don't know, like you don't know what life is going to do. Yeah, Shauna just texted me that she's watching. So she has texted me the picture of me and my like, she zoomed in on it here. Let me uh, let me see if I can show it on the camera. We'll see if it works. Oh, there, there you go. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm just like a space case. Like, okay. <laughs> okay, so I have a kid now. All right. Yeah. Oof. Did I just nuke my own life? And that's fine. It's just, it's a new challenge. It's fulfilling. It's rewarding. But the flip side is I don't pressure people to do it either. It's all about the stage of life that you're in, what you value, what you find rewarding, what you find fulfilling. And frankly, it's about the mother 
that, that's what good, the, the mom is going to be a bigger challenge than the kid. That's what a lot of men don't understand is <laughs> that what happens is they date. Oh, she's the first woman to return my calls and we have sex. Therefore, you have a kid with her and then they get divorced and they're on the Internet telling you how bad all the women are and how terrible it is. And they never should have had kids. And it's like, no, you are a horny guy who had a little bit of attention given to you and then you gave up your whole life. That's, you're not even remotely in my world. You're not remotely in the realm of what matters. So I always tell guys, if you think you want kids, you're dating the mother of your children and the grandparents. So if there's a problem, because you, you want to talk about being alpha, alpha is much less about dating a lot of women and more about, can you just say, hey, this is an attractive woman. I like her, but her grandpa her parents are a mess and I don't want them around my kid because that would just be bad. And then saying, sorry, I think you're a good person, but we just can't do this. Right. That That's more how you have to look at it is. This is going to be the mother. Like I said this, you're at, you're at my wedding. I said this to, you know, one of the reasons I married Sean and people were kind of mortified. The people who didn't know me, if it's your first time meeting Cerno, I don't give off the best impression, I think, because I'm very authentic and truthful. And it takes a while, it takes a while to like me. And I said at the wedding, yeah, one of the reasons that, you know, I married Sean is because I knew her grandparents were great people and that they would be heavily involved with with kids and people were like oh that you know you're because you're supposed to just say oh pure love i found my honey boo and blah 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 blah. but really it's no i obviously was lover obviously but it, it, you have to look at it more the child that you're going to bring in this world are you giving the child the best possibility of having a good life you're marrying into a family it's that traditional values in, in a way that's why there's been a lot of studies on arranged marriages and it looks like on balance, people tend to have better relationships. Well, why? Because if the parents are choosing, choosing, but if the parents hate each other, great. They're not going to choose to couple the, the people. The parents are going to go their own ways. So then you're the parents are more compatible. And then if the parents are compatible, chances are the kids will have a better chance of, of being compatible. And then you learn that, a marriage is less about love and it's more about compatibility. It's more about shared values. You're going to wake up next to this person every day for many, many years. Do you like the person you're waking up to? Or does the person drive you crazy? Or does the person have emotional problems or this and that? So I don't really care. I was telling men, I don't care if you're in love. Yeah, love is nice. You should have both if you can. It's much more about do you have shared values? Do you have... Are you compatible? Can you just kind of like hang out? One person's doing her thing because a lot of people can't. There are a lot of women and I'm sure men too, but just from my perspective who they can't just like let you be on your own. Oh, what are you doing? Oh, we don't talk enough. You're just ignoring me. And you're like ignoring, ignoring you. What do you, you're a human being. What do you mean you're being ignored? You can't be, be in your own for three hours. Are you, are you out of your mind? What, what are you even talking about? Right? So, if, if that's the kind of energy you're getting, you have a kid, you're in for the long haul, so you better be careful. Romantic love is different than companionate love. Uh, um, the author's name, Jonathan Haidt. Jonathan Haidt wrote a great book, uh, Happiness Hypothesis, in there where he really clearly describes the difference between passionate love and companionate love. Uh, passionate love, uh, you know, it's all what we know, you know, the, the chemical infatuation, it only lasts 18, 24 months. It's a big spike and then a crash. Companionate love is something that takes time and it builds over time. And it, over time, even though the slope is, is shallower, the area under the curve is much greater. There's a longer life with much more love and much more uh, compatibility uh, in companionate love. And the transition point between passionate love and companionate love is a danger zone for people in their relationships that could be totally bypassed <laughs> through an arranged marriage, through an arranged marriage. Now that you're a dad, a couple of kids, it's been a few years, do you think people in power, people who make policy, people that give advice, how essential is being a father or a parent or having a family to having a complete understanding of the world 
is it possible to be a single independent man with no kids and still give good advice or be a complete like you know how, how does that work i think you could still have wisdom if you're an old man if you have spiritual depth because you've you've seen it play out you don't i don't believe that you have to fully experience the situation to completely understand it so i've never been bankrupt right i know a lot of guys who have so if somebody wanted to work through the emotions of that I could say, well, you know what? You're going to have a lot of shame because you're going to feel like a loser. You're going to feel like you shouldn't do it. You're going to feel like it's the wrong choice, but here's why it's not. Here's why it's actually not a big deal. A lot of men have pled bankruptcy. They just don't advertise it, so you have no idea that they've done it. But I know a lot of very successful people who have. So even though I've never personally experienced something like that, I've seen it play out enough where I could advise someone on how to, how to do it. So I don't know that you have to have kids to to live a full life. I don't think you have to have uh, to have wisdom to live a full life, to give advice. But you do have to have some kind of experience. If you're just 30 years old and you're telling somebody how to raise their kids, then no. And first of all, if you're 30 years old, you shouldn't be giving people advice on hardly anything at all unless you were an elite level player. And then you can give advice, you know, because I think Wall Street Playboys is a younger person. And that account has good financial advice. And no, I'm not that account. I get asked that all the time. But that, but that's different. But you also don't see Wall Street playboys trying to talk about God or something, right? It's very, very domain specific. So yeah, you can do that. You get older. You see a lot of people go through things. You live through things with friends and family. You can be a you can be a wise old man if you never had kids. Yeah, yeah, that's a good that's a good perspective. I tend to tend to lean a little bit heavier on the side of that whole well-rounded experience. And I do believe that there is a dad circuitry that gets implemented once the kid comes out that's dormant uh, and that sheds new perspective on on things and, and alters your motivations and therefore might change your advice. But I hear you. You have to be perceptive and you have to be engaged and you have to, again, teach yourself. Go out there and learn and observe and process and th synthesize. Um, you brought there are a lot of bad dads too, so. Right. You know, in a way, I think a lot of that's projection because there, you know, maybe there is <laughs> dad surgery. Like, I think you're an amazing dad, but I don't think most dads are very good dads. Uh, a lot of abandonment issues. Um, a lot of dads walk out now. A lot of dads don't raise their kids. A lot of, so I don't, I don't know that the dad circuitry is, is really the answer as much as it's having a, a broader spiritual perspective from living life getting the scars yourself, living through trauma with other people, processing all of that. So I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm more skeptical of, of the dad circuitry, just given how many dads are alcoholics and abusers, don't take care of their kids properly, just don't really give a shit, blame their kids for things, spend all day watching sports on the weekends instead of being with their kids. Point taken. Well argued, sir. <laughs> I think, and persuasive as well. Uh, definitely a lot of shit ass dads out there that uh, drive a hole right through that argument for me. So I appreciate that. Hey, a day that I learn something is a good day. No question about that. Uh, let's let's shift gears now into the last little segment. God, the universe. My personal experience with religion has been, I was raised Jewish, I was bar mitzvahed at 13, I also was uh, went to Catholic church because I'm half, half Catholic, half Jewish, or I was. Then I, I, I walked away from all of that, none of it took. And I even got to a point in my probably mid-20s, late-20s, where I was openly disdainful of religion and people that were religious and spiritual. And I remember thinking to myself, like, wow, those people are creepy. I don't like it. It's weird. I look back now on it, and I think the creepy thing was that they were happy and kind and generous and positive, and it struck me, and I didn't know how to process or interface with that because, you know, I was just living the, the urban, cynical, hip, cool guy, you know, downtown life and all that. But today I'm more open to the notion of God and religion than ever before in my life. And if I haven't made it over the threshold into being maybe like a true believer or whatever you might say um i feel like i'm on a journey um 
And I feel like, Mike, you've clearly been on a journey when it comes to this. And I'm, I'm just happy to hear a little bit of your recap of that process for you, where you are, what does it mean? How, how does it, does it propel you in some way? Like, give us an update on it on for you personally with this process, because it's, it's fascinating to me, parallels and such. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in a religious environment, too, and it never, and it was more like brainwashing. Religion when you're a kid is, is all about indoctrination and orthodoxy, everything when you're a kid, unfortunately. And that's when in raising your own kids, you don't want to say this is just the way it is. Everything with with um, my daughters, especially Syra, she's older, is communication based. Hey, why do we tell you to do this thing? Do I tell you to do random things? No. Do I tell you to do things just because it's a power trip? No. Okay, so there's probably a reason to it versus my house, my rules. There's a God. If you don't follow this God, then here's all the bad consequences that are going to follow. And that is the issue that, because I have a lot of problems when I just talk about ayahuasca. I'll have Christians in my notifications telling me that it's demons and everything else. And my response to that is, gee, I never thought of that. I grew up evangelical Christian where people spoke in tongues at house churches. It never occurred to me that it never, you're so smart, you're so wise, right? Let me, let me thank you for this great gift of knowledge that you're conveying. And you realize like that's just their own ego because how would you, re if you've believed that I'm doing something that's opening me up to, demo to demons, how would that help? That's just ego and an orthodoxy and indoctrination. That's not love. That's not trying to persuade anyone. That's just you having grown up with an orthodoxy, holding that like a hammer and hitting everyone else over the head with a hammer. Of course, religion gets a bad name because of that, right? That's your that's your response. Oh, gee, I never, never thought about that. Hmm. Thank you for... 15 people in my comments, you know, telling me that. Wow. <laughs> so there, there's there's that energy. Then there's also the energy of this is why spirituality gets a bad name. It's I'm saying that we're the warrior class. We're reclaiming spirituality. We'll, we'll redeem it. Because a lot of people turn to religion or spirituality because they don't like this world or can't make it in this world or don't want to work hard in this world. And everything for them is about escapism. Those are the people, oh, man, the tie-dye thing. There was even a really funny satire of that. Uh, who's the guy? He's got long red hair. He's a pretty jacked guy. He does a lot Chair of stuff. No, he does a lot of political commentary, a lot of spiritual commentary because he ran in that world. Man, I can't. He's got a great channel. I'll try to remember and I text you. But he did a great bit on this where you got two spiritual guys sitting around. They're going, oh. You know, you come up here. Oh, hey, hey, Mike, how are you? I'm like, I'm doing well. And you say, Oh, Mike, I got. You won't believe it. Yesterday, the most amazing thing happened. I got this thing, and you show me, and I go, Wow, that's like really cool. But you know, I don't want my ego to come out too much. But that's actually not really the most amazing thing. There's this other thing that's even more amazing. And then your ego comes out. Well, brother, that's a little bit egotistical, but. And it's very kind of passive aggressive and a lot of quote unquote spiritual people, or at least the face of spirituality are they're passive aggressive. They have that ego still, but they try to wrap it in a tone. Hey man, what's your problem, dude? What's wrong, man? Well, if really you were a spiritual rich guy, you wouldn't care what the guy's problem was in that sense, because you wouldn't be trying to modulate his behavior. You would just say, okay, brother, that's amazing. I'm glad, I'm glad that happened to you. And it wouldn't have any impact. So because of that, because of that, you either have people running around with a hammer, their religion is away and they want to bang you over the head with the hammer, or you have the people who are checked out of life and are running from something and running from real growth. They become the face of mysticism or spirituality. And then there's another way, which is that God is real. This is not something that I even argue because people it might always say he's not there's no such thing as god my answer is all right man good for you <laughs> I'm, I'm not here to convince you i don't care if you believe or not believe it's just but to me that's like telling me something that i've experienced never happened isn't real and that's the third way is 
taking the message from the spirit world, taking the message from God, and then walking in this world as well. So you're walking between both worlds. You're walking in this physical realm that we perceive for the majority of our time. And then you're walking in the spiritual realm occasionally or frequently depending upon your own spiritual practices. And you're, you're taking the messages back and forth between the worlds and then trying to make this world more aspirational, more beautiful, more spiritual, but doing it in a way that is, again, it's just about your own work. It isn't about spirituality truly is about your own work inside yourself. Because if you heal your trauma, you're not going to traumatize others. If you hurt less, you're going to hurt other people less, right? There's that expression, hurt people, hurt people. So just by virtue of healing yourself and developing more spiritual ri richness, you're going to, at the very least, quit hurting people in the way that you might have done before or repeating trauma, traumatic cycles that maybe you weren't even aware of. You say, oh, okay, I realized that I was repeating something that I didn't even know was traumatic. I didn't even know that I was imposing trauma on others by doing that. But then I realized I had that trauma hidden and repressed and masked. So I'm going to I'm going to end that cycle. So at the very least, the spiritual work will have you not harming or not creating more trauma in the world. And then ideally, as you become more enlightened and become more of an aspirational being, then that will surface and you'll do more service for others. You'll help others not because you need a plaque or a building named after you or recognition or even the, the feeling of ego that you've done something that I've helped X number of people, but because that's just what you do. That's your emanating light. You're right. You're being not doing that's your other journey. So when you, when you live that way, you just, you live your life. You don't need to hit anybody over the head with a hammer and you don't need to hide from life. You're just shining light as much as you can on the world. It reminds me of the old game stuff where you'd be like, uh, you open up the door to your life and invite someone to come in, like frame and just that's also kindness uh, rather than beating people over the head with it. Uh, you've mentioned the word trauma a number of times, uh, and you know it got me thinking about my own personal trauma. I grew up in a household of trauma. Uh, my dad was physically abusive, mentally, spiritually abusive, like crazy. My mom, alcohol, uh, drug addiction. Uh, she was abused as well, too. I lived in a house of violence, uh, of, of unpredictability, of real trauma. And I had no idea. I had no idea that I lived in a house of trauma until I went to therapy, until I sat down and the therapist gave me a worksheet, and I checked off all these yes, 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 all the way down the list. And he's like, by the way, six out of 12 is a household of trauma, and you're at 11 of 12 here. I'm like, oof. So that was part of the process of me beginning to understand how that trauma affected my bonding mechanisms, my attachment mechanisms to people, uh, and my own self-talk and my personal frame of reference. Um You've mentioned trauma enough now that I have to ask, like, what's been your personal trauma that you have uncovered and that you've been healing from, that you've been working through? Well, fortunately, fortunately, most of my trauma was available to me. I just didn't understand it as a concept of trauma, right? Mm. I didn't have that language because when people would talk about trauma, I would kind of roll my eyes a little bit. Oh, God, trauma, you know, everybody has trauma sort of deal. But you, you, you realize that a lot of the hardest people in the world are hard because of the trauma that they faced. And dealing with the trauma hurts so much that we're not equipped to that. If you don't have the spiritual tools, then you're not equipped to dealing with the trauma. It would just feel like you're ripping your heart open and salt is being poured all over it. And you don't even know what to do. You don't have the tools. So then we mask it with ego. We mask it by, coming, by becoming stronger. And then we cover it up. And then we don't even know we have it anymore. We don't even know that it influences us, right? That we become, uh, we believe it, although we, we work it out without knowing it because it, it's always there with us. So for me, you know, the trauma of growing up poor, the trauma of a bipolar mother, the trauma of the, the, the fat bullied kid, I, I got to see how, you know, bullied people become bullies, you know? Maybe I'm a little too harsh with people. Maybe... Maybe one reason I'm harsh with people is because the way that I dealt with my trauma was to become stronger, but maybe I'm not being helpful to that person by just shaking them and saying, you need to harden up. 
maybe that really isn't the answer. Maybe it is for a certain type of personality. Maybe it isn't. So then I would ask, am I recreating trauma on other people? Because maybe that maybe my harsh tone is what that person grew up with in an abusive environment. And now maybe they're reliving that in a way, even though I don't mean it to be harsh or abusive, I just mean it in a way that this is how you make life happen. This is what you got to do. You got to be a hard ass. You got to hit it hard. You got to be able to take the blows. So then I pause a little bit and say, okay, maybe that's not the right approach. So dealing with that, the healthy, healthy, the, the dealing with the trauma processing in a healthy way, and then asking yourself, you know, am I am I recreating trauma in the in the world? Am I making am I making other people feel bullied? And then you become at least a very least more insightful because there are people who have legitimately tried to destroy my life, and then they find out that that maybe wasn't such a good choice. Um, that's for sure. But then the flip side to that is, you know, I'm just creating more trauma and that person really was kind of irrelevant anyway. Why did I even care? I, but I felt like you can't bully me. So then I'm reliving the bully story, right? So the, the, the answer to the bully story is the martial arts movies, the, the embeds. So I got bullied as a kid. I trained hard, crazy. I beat up everybody that ever bullied me and I beat some of them up pretty bad. Except for one guy, he went to prison before I could get to him. And when I was home from college, I ran into him at a pizza hut and he was at a urinal and I almost went there and I was going to literally, you know, and, and thankfully I didn't because that, that would have been a bad thing. But that's where my mind was. You know, anyone who did this to me, you're going to get it. But then I realize now these people were probably beaten up by their parents. They had alcoholic parents, uh, alcoholic dads. Like, what did they even know how to do? They didn't know how to do anything. It, is, it wasn't about me. There wasn't something about me that made me deserving of it. They were just being beaten up. Because I was never abused. I got spanked, which some people would call abusive. I, I don't spank, but I wouldn't use that language. Because spanking is usually within a, there's like a structure. You know, if you do X, you might get a spanking. So even though I don't do it and I don't believe in spanking, that would be different than abuse, which tends to be random, right? That's what makes abuse abuse. It's one thing if your parents are hard asses and there are consequences that maybe are a little harsh. It's another thing where, oh, shit, dad came home. He had a bad day. Shit, everybody look out. That chaos is what makes it abusive. So then I realized, I mean, what did I win by beating up all the people who bullied me, right? And then you realize I carry that to adulthood where if you try to pick a, a conflict with me, like I'm, I'm going to lean into that and you're going to wish that you had never done this. And, and so I've, I've moved away from that pattern. So I realized that the trauma of me being bullied made me able to justify going after people who in many cases are truly bad people. But then I go, why do I even want to do that anymore? Do I, you know, do I even want to do that anymore? So my threshold for conflict is significantly higher than it used to be. National security issues, basically, at this point, right? <laughs> it's hard. It's really, really hard to, to bait me, that's for sure. Because then I think about they were probably traumatized and they're dealing with their own issues. And so the difference is obviously if somebody – pointing a gun in my head, it'd be a different, I'm not going to worry about that person's trauma in that moment. Well, other methods, but the flip side is when people lash out at me, when people attack me, oh no, somebody wrote another dumb hit piece on me. You know, who cares, right? It's not, it doesn't even register in the way that it used to, whereas before I would think, I can't believe this, right? This is blah, 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 blah. But that's just my own recreation or reliving trauma, reliving my response to trauma, and then creating more trauma in the world, who wins? Everybody loses in that. I want to point out something. We're talking about trauma here. We're not talking about being victims, guys. We're not talking about carrying around a victim mindset, or blaming people. Oh, I was traumatized, and therefore my behavior is excused, or I don't have to do this. What we're talking about is being an auto-regulating man, which is a term you turned me on two years ago. And it's about acknowledging the source of this behavior and these attitudes in yourself. Why? To make change. 
right? To change your behavior, to change yourself, to end the cycles of trauma, and to not sit around being a victim all the time. And uh, I'm just going to share just something, personal thing. Um, my dad and I never had a relationship beyond about 13 or 12. Uh, and that's when the, that's when the abuse really started. The 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 flying off the handle, rage induced, unrelated violence to my behavior. And uh, he basically destroyed our relationship forever uh, with that. And he hasn't healed himself to this point. And so I don't have any experiences with my dad as a teenager that are positive, or any really, but that are positive. And um, and now and now that I'm having these experiences with my kids, my teenage kids right now, um, I'm realizing that I'm learning, I'm living positive parental teenager experiences for the first time. And it feels so foreign and new and like why and there's like an emptiness in my brain where like I'm supposed to be comparing this experience with the experience that I had with my kid or my father and it's not it's not there and um it uh, it's making me a little emotional thinking about it no, right I was now. about to say you're, you're letting out trauma now which is beautiful yeah and it, it's just I'm just so proud of the fact that um I'm able to do this with my kids and see how healthy how healthy and happy that they are when i was their age dude i was stealing things burning things getting drunk fighting you know rob i robbed a teacher at school once why i i don't want to do that i didn't want to do it then but i i was in in a space of trauma and 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 stress and i didn't know how to act i didn't know how to act and now I see my kids effortlessly just not being criminals. <laughs> like, like somehow this is like a big accomplishment that they're not criminal children. Um, but it just uh, it gives me a lot of pride uh, and love and lots of love. And, and people out there, when Mike, Mike says that he does things out of love and empathy and kindness, it, he means it. I know that this bullying thing that we've been talking about and the aggression and that stuff comes out often. And if you only get glimpses of it, uh, you don't get the whole picture. Mike and I first started, our relationship began many years ago. And one of the very first things I remember is that I was having an issue. And it involved law and the FBI, FBI and stuff because this politician I donated to got arrested for corruption. And, uh, and Mike, you just stopped everything you were doing. We didn't even really know each other at that point. And you just, you were like, dude, I got a girl in my bedroom right now. And instead of doing that, I am talking to you to help you with this issue. And I'll never, I'll never forget that ever. Um, the kindness and outreach that you gave me then uh, really set the stage for, you know, this now decade long relationship that we've had. So uh, thanks for that, first of all. And, uh, and second of all, thank you for having the courage to talk about things like trauma and emotions and vulnerability. We talked about crying earlier on in the beginning of this podcast. None of these things that people on the outside who look at us are like, oh, alpha male, gorilla mindset. <laughs> these guys must be Neanderthals. Uh, but really, there's a lot of complexity and depth there. So I appreciate that, Mike. Thanks thanks a lot well, for all that that's work. Their, that's their own trauma, too, though. That's so... You know, first, as, as to you healing the trauma with your children, that's how you heal your own trauma is by re not recreating the cycle. That's how you heal the trauma that you went through. And that's why you get emotional, because you're still, you know, you're still holding on to that. And you're still, even though that happened 30 years ago, when you were 13, you're still holding on to that trauma. And the way you heal that trauma is you don't recreate it in other people and you become aware of it. And that's why, yeah, we never used the word victim. We never said to feel sorry for yourself. We actually said the opposite, which is you can heal yourself. It's about healing trauma versus living in denial of your trauma. Because living, when you live in denial of your trauma, you're now self-victimizing. Because you're now hurt. You're, you're no different than someone who's cutting themselves with a razor blade so that they can feel something. Your cuts are all invisible, but you're still harming yourself. You're dealing with self-victimization. And then what makes that more troublesome is that then you're going to harm other people not realizing it because you harm yourself and you're going to treat other people the way that you treat yourself. And then you you cut off that line of trauma. You you'd no longer recreate it. And then that's how you end you end the line. And then your children, you know, they grow up 
and do their own thing. And, you know, they're going to have trauma too, but it, it'll be much less, um, hopefully, than, than I had or especially than you had. And then the, the idea, yeah, this, it's, it's a strange thing that when people are triggered in a way by, by oh, they're, they're masculine or, oh, they're big guys or alpha, because that tells me they have trauma. That tells me they didn't have male role models. That tells me that they probably had abusive um, men in their lives. They had so when they see men, especially larger men, that makes them afraid, which all often leads to them saying that's a douchebag, that's a bad person. But then that's again them not being aware of their own trauma and their own unhealthiness. And then of course the same thing is true of men who can't occupy that third way of you know, nobody here is saying don't, don't develop your masculinity, but just realize that there's, there's shadow energy, there's dark energy, there's a trauma from the world, there's a trauma from yourself that you've imposed on yourself. And then there's also higher energy. There's angelic energy, there's good energy in the world too. And then you can tap into that and talk about it because I have no interest in letting a feminist tell me what it means to be a man. I have zero interest in what the people who wrote, right, Jezebel or won't get at the Washington Post or the New York Times. I have zero interest in what they have to say about masculinity. But the flip side is there is toxic masculinity, but it's just shadow masculinity. It's the terms that people use. It isn't. It, that's why they are creating trauma and not actually trying to help people heal. Because if you did, you wouldn't maybe use terms like toxic masculinity you would use Jungian terms, constructive terms, like, no, it's shadow masculinity. That's the little boy inside you who felt that he wasn't seen. And now that you're a man, you're going to impose yourself on the world because you want to be seen because as a child, maybe you weren't seen. And that's playing out in a way that's not only destructive to personal relationships and to society, but the relationship with yourself that you, you need to work on yourself. And that's the third path. I think that you're trying to occupy that I'm occupying too, which is no one's saying real men don't cry. No one's saying you're broken if you're a man, because that's a dialectic. If you're a man, you don't cry. No, you don't cry, but you lash out on other people because you feel that becomes anger inside of your heart. So maybe you don't cry, but you're going to make other people cry as you lash out on your behavior. The flip side that being a man is inherently broken and the only way to become a better man is to become more like a woman. And then the third way is that you work on the energy within yourself, the shadow within yourself, and you work to overcome that and to find your higher self. I appreciate that, Mike. It's a interesting book. And to think back, um, I remember my very first piece that I ever wrote anywhere online, you had tweeted something out about therapy for men. And I tweeted something back at you. And in your very Mike way, you said, well, write a blog post about it then. <laughs> And so I did. And then you published it on Danger and Play, and that was back in like 2014 or 15, maybe. And uh, uh, interesting bookend to to this relationship, your growth, my growth, all this stuff that uh, my writing started off talking about therapy and healing for men. Here we are all these years later, two people that people on the outside would probably call Neanderthal, alpha male, whatever, idiots. And here we are on the other end of it, still talking about trauma, still talking about uh, trying to embrace um, a dynamic sense of masculinity that doesn't fit into either one of these pigeonholes and is, is more holistic, holistic and comprehensive. So thank you very much for that, Mike. I appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time today to talk to me and to talk to everyone. Uh, thanks for your work. I'll admit, man, you know, you, you've been a few steps ahead of me on this path, and I've learned a ton uh, from watching you, and the support that you've given me over the years has been incredible. And here I am now, actualized, independent, anti-fragile, changing the world, living the life. And uh, I have you uh, to thank for that in part. So thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate that. And I appreciate pleasure, the time brother. coming. I appreciate the time coming, coming on here. And uh, thanks for talking to us. So, guys, it's Mike Cernovich. You know where to find him, at Cernovich on Twitter, Cernovich.com, Telegram, YouTube, Instagram, everywhere, Mike Cernovich. Anywhere else you want to drop or anything else you want to plug right now, Mike? No, they can go to thecigarnight.com. So, you know, you can't reply to me on Twitter anymore, <laughs> but 
if you if you if you're not resourceful enough to figure out how to make it to a cigar night where I keep tickets um, inexpensive, then then probably we're not ready to meet at this point in time. <laughs> Come down if you got something to say to Mike, say it to his face. Basically, is where we are. Now. Well, but people like though because a lot of the guys you know who come to my stuff are still a little. Maybe they're not quite as higher self as I am right now. So I would I would just say be 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 very well be very well behaved. Be, that's what I tell you guys in the liminal order. There's only one rule: pretend as if you're sitting in my living room, and conduct yourself accordingly. Great advice. Thanks a lot, Mike. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Appreciate it. Uh, new videos every day. New podcasts every Monday, guys. Hit subscribe, remind all that stuff. Share it. Appreciate it. Until the next time. Thanks, and we are out.